morning, everyone. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for coming out on the final day of the festival. Um, I don't know how many of you have been here every single day, every single hour, like me. But if you have been, then I congratulate you on your stamina. Um, let's get right into it. We're delighted to have this panel this morning um, with three biographers um, who are going to be talking about not just their specific, most recent books, um, but about the, the perils, the pitfalls, the opportunities, the joys of the art of, of biography. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Richard Brereton, who is sort of hidden behind me, um, who, as everyone knows, is one of our most eminent historians, um, emerita professor of history at the University of the West Indies, um, author of several books, including a biography herself of John Gorey, um, a, a wonderful biography of a 19th century colonial official in Trinidad and Tobago. And she's going to be having a conversation with Professor Selwyn Kujo, who um, as many of you know, is the author of The Slave Master of Trinidad, which was long listed for the 2019 OCM Bocas Prize, which I think deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Alongside um, two authors of um, biographies in the, the UE Press Caribbean biography series, which is a pretty special series which the University of the West Indies Press um, launched a couple of years ago, doing short, very readable, very incisive biographies of important people in Caribbean history, Caribbean culture, Caribbean everything. Uh, so Judy Raymond, um, uh, who's actually written, I think this is probably a fourth biography in total, um, also well known as a journalist, editor-in-chief of the Newsday, and Professor Funcho Ayejina, um, now happily retired from the University of the West Indies, so an emeritus professor himself of West Indian literature, a great expert on the work of Earl Lovelace, who's also the subject of his biography. So everyone, enjoy the conversation. Let's welcome everyone with a round of applause, and we'll get started. Right. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Um, our three panelists um, are very, very well known to the Bocas family. Um, Funso, as you all know, is an award-winning creative writer, poet, short storyteller, I believe, a playwright, playwright also. He's um, a literary critic a teacher and a mentor. He founded the MFA Creative Writing Program at UWI St. Augustine. He's a former dean of the faculty. He's like me, a retired, a retired prof. And he has been involved in BOCAS since the very inception. And he serves as deputy festival director. His um, biography, as Nicholas told you, is of none other than Earl Lovelace, and it is a biography in the UWI Press Caribbean biography series. Judy, very, very accomplished, very well-known Trinidad and Tobago writer, long-time journalist. I always like that phrase, veteran journalist, which people, people like to use. She, was, she is a former editor of the TNT Guardian and current editor, for her sins, I think, of the TNT Newsday. She um, has written about, in her journalist career, written about practically every subject, but I think particularly she always had an interest in culture. She has, as Nicholas said, um, published several biographies. Um, I particularly admire her biography of Richard Bridgens, which I think really um, opened a window into early 19th century Trinidad society. But her most recent one, is her biography of Beryl McBurney. Thank you. And that is in the same UWI Press Caribbean biography series. Selwyn Kajo, my longtime colleague and friend, eminent historian and literary scholar, has been based at Wellesley College in Massachusetts for a very long time. Um, he has also, he's published extensively many books on Trinidad culture and cultural history and social history. He'd written a previous biography of Weber, a most interesting Tobago-born Guyanese writer and politician. But the most recent biography is the um, biography of William Hardin Burnley. Can you hold it up and show him? Okay. <laughs> yes. hold up man. The, right. <laughs> Um, where 
we attempt to write somebody else's life. Not autobiography or memoir, but autobiography and memoir, I notice, has, has become an extremely popular genre of writing. Life writing when you write your own life or maybe a chunk of it, as in a childhood memoir, when you reminisce about a particular period of your life. But today we are looking at the art of biography, where we attempt to study and write the life story of somebody else. Of course it's non-fiction, or it should be non-fiction, non but there is definitely an art to biographical writing. Now, if I think about these three biographies, apart from the obvious difference in length, and that is, uh, that is easy to explain, the UWI Pressed Caribbean Biography Series by design is a series of short biographies. They clock in at just over 100 pages, and by design again, meant for the general reader. So um, they are not burdened by very heavy annotations or very extensive bibliography. Selwyn's is considerably longer and is certainly a full-scale, academic, um, heavily researched, heavily annotated biography. But the, but the difference that interested me particularly when I thought about it is this. In Funso's case, he is writing about an individual who is, I'm happy to say, very much with us. I don't know if he's in this room, but he is most definitely alive and well and with us. So Funso was able to base his biography to quite a large extent on interviews with him, as well as on his writings, and Funso's own personal knowledge of his subject since he has known Lovelace and written about him for, for many decades. In Judy's case, um, Beryl McBurney died in 2000. She's not with us, but she died fairly recently. So Judy was able to interview quite a number of people who knew her well and worked with her. And that in fact forms, along with newspapers and other documentary sources, forms um, one of the major sources on which she could base her book. Now for Selwyn, none of that was possible. Mr. Burnley died in 1850. So this is a conventional historical biography of the kind that I attempted with my man who died in 1892. His biography could only be based on the documentary sources about him, by him, and about him, which have survived up to the present. In other words, the archives, the colonial archives. So I'd like to start the conversation by asking our three biographers how their different situation with respect to their subject influenced their work. Funso, you want to start? Sure. <coughs> Hello, good morning. Thanks for coming. Um, this, this is like, like 10 times the number of people I expected to see in the audience. <laughs> so I thank you all very much for coming. Uh, the fact that my subject is alive is a big challenge in the sense that um, every uh, fact that I try to put in, I have to cross check properly. I have to double check. I have to triple check. And um, the other thing that makes it also very uh, challenging for me, we are personal friends, and we have been friends for years, so that there will be things that I, be, I would have been privy to uh, that the public would not be privy to. So I have to make a judgment call. Should that come in or not come in? And the judgment call I made in this work is if it is important to demonstrate the nature of his being, the nature of his essence, then I try to find ways to reflect it in the work. And if it, is, uh, if it might be slightly embarrassing, I find a way to put it across in such a way that uh, you can only read between the line and get, uh, get some meaning. Uh, and so that, that is the major challenge uh, I had. The other challenge I had was even just interviewing him. Um, 
I don't know how many of you have tried to uh, sit down with Earl and interview him in a structured manner. It's almost impossible. I spent the first three years just letting him talk. So I have stacks and stacks and stacks of tips. Uh, that, well, I'm, I'm sure they're useless now. With, uh, they don't they usually think so. So that I, then I, I, would, I would play a 45 minute tape and get, say, a five minute worth of material. But that was the only way it could be done. You had to let the man talk. Uh, you, uh, you ask a question and he will tell you, go on to answer whatever he wants to say. What is uh, at that moment in time, what is important to him? He will, he will talk about that. And then the other uh, challenge I had in personal conversation, Earl has a lot of silences. A lot of um, um, uh, and, and, uh, and so on. So that for somebody who, for a scholar who just, you want the facts as quickly as possible. So I had to adapt to that. The, then the other challenge I had is his handwriting. <laughs> so that I've already said this on, even in writing that he has crapo right and get crap of food uh, so that even when I got documents that he had written uh, it was difficult to decipher them and he himself could not decipher them <laughs> so uh, that, 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 that was uh, also another challenge I had so although he is alive with us there were challenges along the way um, as we go along if other things come up uh, I will ch chip in Well, as you pointed out, Beryl has been dead for a while, but not so long that there are not still people who remember her, who worked with her fairly closely. Although, of course, um, most of the ones who worked with her in the very early days are no longer with us. Um, so I try to find a representative cross section of some of the younger ones and some of the ones who worked with her since, say, the 50s. Um, unfortunately, some, some of the more important early ones are no longer with us. Um, there are definite advantages, nevertheless, to writing about somebody who is dead because someone may have a particular vision of themselves which may not match how you see them or how other people see them and may, especially in a small society like this, take great objection to what you are saying about them or other people may be offended on their behalf on uh, about what you're saying about them um so if they're dead that helps because you don't have to worry at, le at least about you know whether they are going to sue you for what you have written or whatever um i've also written about two people who are still with us and they're Another disadvantage in doing that is that not so much that you may offend them, but okay, one, one of the people I've written about is the jeweler Bar Barbara Jardine, a goldsmith, who is an intuitive artist. Um, she is sufficiently skilled and experienced basically to be able to tap straight into her subconscious and produce a, a beautiful piece of work without having to think through the significance of what she's doing. I mean, she, there are technical details that she will have to work out. How am I going to achieve this effect and so on? But she makes basically what is autobiographical jewelry, which sounds strange, but I mean, she's made, you know, boxes with lids that have pictures, scenes on them. Um, and there's one particular piece she made, which is called Metamorphosis, which is it's basically a pendant. And it's quite scary looking. It's a sort of cross between a woman and some kind of moth-like creature pushing her way out of a chrysalis. And if you talk to, to Barbara about that, she would tell you it's, a, it's symbolic of rebirth. But it looks like something a lot scarier than that. It looks like it has to do with anger and maybe revenge, loss, despair. So I had her account of, you know, this is what this piece means and this is why I made it. And 
I disagreed with it. So I had to write that. So contradicting what an artist says about what they were doing in their own work. I mean, sometimes you have to do something like that. And it is kind of awkward contradicting someone about something they made and think they're the expert on. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys all for coming out this morning, you know. Uh, it's intriguing. Uh, Earl is still alive. Beryl died in 2000. Burnley died in 1850, as uh, uh, Barrett, um, Bridget said. And of course, you have the advantage of speaking with Earl and so on. But as you open the question, it made me think of a guy like Hayden White, who told the history of consciousness. And even in terms of writing history, the term he uses is implotment. Mm -hmm. That even though it may seem to be a neutral process, the construction of the text is always, always involves the writer or the put in his thing. Yeah. So by the advantages of speaking with the person, while they're there and the person being close, we have other, somebody who's long dead, the other kinds of problems. The first one was, of course, I, I wrote about Burnley in 18, first time I booked Movement of the People in 1984. The only thing I had to go on, so you see guys what advantage you were. The only thing I had to go on is that a guy called James Lamont who was James Lamont's the big, second biggest plantation in the country, and his nephew, Norman Lamont, I think, in a, that historical society thing, is a small piece. We had only 20 pages. The only thing we had in Burnley was a 20-page document, nothing else. And from that, I had to construct a life. That's why I go back to implotment. You had to construct a life with nothing. And so the difficulty, the, the challenge here was to go into the documents uh, I didn't even know where I was going to find them. Go into documents and construct a life. And in constructing the life, you had all kinds of approaches. You got the pieces you'll find. In fact, I paid about uh, 250 pounds for one letter. I mean, you all have, have one letter for Burnley's signature and so on and so forth. Uh, so we didn't have that kind of information. But in terms of Lamont's work, he had a lot of interviews and so on. A lot of, he had the paper. He had the papers. So, family papers. So I didn't have that. So I just had to go to the archives and really look and start from scratch and really construct a life based on the papers and certain kinds of intuitive kinds of feelings and how you, how you read that text. But I think the one thing we do have in common, which we all have regardless, is the question of implotment. We all have to plot and construct and make of that life. Yeah. Good. That is the art, the art of biography. Um, and I'm sure several of the points that our three panelists just made are going to come up again a little later. Another big difference in these three biographies, and the subtitle of this panel is Heroes and villain, Villains. Another big difference. Um, Earl Lovelace is a beloved writer and um, elder statesman, if I could say that, of Trinidad and Tobago and Caribbean literature. Um, he is an icon in the best, best sense of that much overused term. Um, Beryl McBurney also has been rightly, greatly admired, greatly loved for her pioneering work in resuscitating, reviving, capturing, resuscitating, validating um, Afro-Creole culture, particularly dance. Although she had her faults and her foibles, which um, Judy does not hide, does not seek to hide in her biography. But of course, William Burnley falls into a bit of a different category. He was the owner of enslaved people. He was the single largest owner of enslaved human beings in Trinidad as a politician, which he definitely was. He led the movement against first improving the conditions of the enslaved, and then he led the movement against emancipation itself. And as some of you will probably remember, a bit of a controversy did develop in the public newspapers, the public print, as we like to say, um, about whether Selwyn ought to have written, researched, and written a biography of this person altogether. So that leads us into all kinds of questions. Does the biographer have to love or admire his subject? 
Is that necessary to write a decent biography? I remember the American um, scholar and award-winning biographer, David McCullough, who's written many um, famous books. He devoted about two years to researching a biography that he intended to write of Pablo Picasso. And after about two years, he decided he disliked this individual so much, not the artist, the human being, he disliked this individual so much that he was not going to devote another two years of his life in writing the biography, and he didn't, he abandoned it. So, um, is it important that the biographer, it is important that the biographer understands or seeks to understand what makes his or her subject tick? Must the biographer like or admire his or her subject? Does it matter? How does it matter? So, and you want to start on this one? Okay. And then we'll, we'll go to the other two. When this young woman, this woman told me about it was hero and villains. I didn't get her. She said hero, villain. I didn't realize that it was a subtitle. Uh, the question the is, and I think it's almost irrelevant in my context, he doesn't do it like or dislike. Here was a guy who had a certain kind of relationship to me in terms of geographical space. Right. Tagarigua. Tagarigua. Yeah. He was the biggest slaveholder here. He made money before slavery, he made money after slavery. Uh, my parents, in fact, in 1838, when he got in there, he says, you know, after, after these people begin to squat and so on, clear the damn place out, get rid of all of them. So my thing was simply of him as a subject. I think what I like or dislike never came into the picture. And that's what I find is a kind of disturbing kind of discussion. The more important thing, which I think, and I take it from an intellectual point of view, is that and I'll just, it has nothing to do with like or dislike. You cannot understand slavery if you don't understand. It's a dialectical process. You can't have a slave without a master. You can't have a serf without whatever. So the question is, and I was reading somebody's book last night, uh, and the only person's, only country in terms of all the slave territories that does not have a biography of a slave master, it's really not. this guy did Samuel Taylor, who we just did in Jamaica, and, so, and we had Edward Long and all that. We don't have any history of any of our slave masters. And I would put it far to all of these people who are so very radical and all that kind of good stuff. You cannot understand slavery without understanding the role of the master. It's a dialectical process. One needs the other to exist. And when I went at Burnley, I only want to find what the fellow was about. I, in fact, I suspended that, if you call it, to talk about what I like. And that was irrelevant. So that was not important. What was important is really fleshing out the subject and seeing how he operated within the context of a life and his centrality to who we are in Trinidad Tobago. Um, I would absolutely agree with Selwyn that it, his book is an important book that should have been written. I mean, you can't only write about people you approve of or like or who can be classed as heroes. Um, but I would disagree with him on the point of whether you like them or don't like them. I mean, I, I personally find it very difficult to write, especially at any length about somebody without feeling some degree of sympathy for them, even though I might not agree with their attitudes on everything. Um, I mean, I thought the argument about whether one ought to write about someone like Bernie was completely ridiculous. But I can kind of understand where that attitude comes from. I mean, we have this bad habit in this country of referring to people who've accomplished anything major as icons. And an icon is you know, an, an early religious picture of a saint, the Madonna or wh whoever. And it was, they were painted before perspective was invented. So they are flat, they're one dimensional. And, you know, Beryl was highly regarded, is often described as an icon. But in her case, some of the things, some of the qualities about her that allowed her to achieve what she did achieve against quite considerable odds given the time when she lived, the attitude to indigenous culture, the fact that she was female, um, the stubbornness and single-mindedness that allowed her to build her theater nevertheless in contravention of you know, planning rules and minor niceties like that. Also, 
proved to be her downfall in some ways in the end, because as far as she was concerned, it was her theater, she built it. And when other people had different ideas about how it should be used, what it should be used for, which would have made it financially viable, and so that she could have focused on building a dance company, researching dance more, um, preserving, studying more local dance, doing more choreography. And instead she was still out pounding the pavements, trying to raise money for air conditioning or seating or whatever. And other people could have taken that over and done it for her, who were, who were more skilled in that area than she, than she was. No, she wouldn't let them. It was her theatre. It was for dance, full stop. So basically, she took it back. And look at the state of the Carib now. I mean, it is dark most of the time. Whereas if she hadn't done that, it might still be a centre for all kinds of performing arts. And a lot more could be going on there now instead of having spread out into places like Alice Yard, Big Black Box, other theatres around Port of Spain, or, or spaces that are used as theatres around Port of Spain. So... It's kind of simplistic to, to divide somebody into a hero or villain. I mean, it's obvious in some cases, as in the case of Burnley. But generally, everybody have their, has their faults, even the ones that we, we call icons. And, and a biography needs to be a complete portrait of that person, not just the great things they did. I think another disadvantage we have is that some of our achievers have tried to preempt biographies of themselves by writing autobiographies which leave out the difficult bits, the awkward bits. Um, you know, like Eric Williams's Inward Hunger, which doesn't mention his love life, his wives, any of those things. Um, P.J. Patterson's memoirs, which came out last year, he does the same thing. It's basically, you know, it's like... A public... Public. It's like the, the raised guest eye of a Roman emperor or something. It's, you know, what, what, what was accomplished while, I and while, I, while he was running his party and under the Manleys. There's nothing about, very little about his personal life. You discover, you know, a couple hundred pages in that, oh, he's married. Oh, his wife is pregnant. They're about to have a child. I mean, there's no mention up to that point that, of any of those things. Um, so I think, you know, sometimes people hope or think that what they did publicly was the important thing, but that does not present a picture of a whole person, or they, they, they try to pass it off as that rather than a political memoir or whatever. And I, I, th I think that has unfortunately influenced the shockingly small number of biographies that we do have the way people have seen themselves and chosen to write about themselves and other people who have gone on to write about them have followed in their footsteps very often in that regard. Uh, my uh, response to the issue of what you should write about is simply that it is not what you write about that matters. It is what you say about what you are writing about that counts. So you can write about the devil as far as I'm concerned, it's what you say about the devil that I want to know. You can write about uh, angels. It's what you say about them that uh, will be my preoccupation. So I have no problem with that. But having said that, I want to say, uh, say two things. In the case of the uh, Caribbean Biography series, the... I will let out a, a trade secret. <laughs> when that, the concept paper for that series was done, which I did, it was designed for a specific purpose. And it was designed in such a way that when we have a subject, we find the corresponding writer. So we, we, we decide on who is going to write on a subject, uh, which therefore uh, removes the whole issue of whether you want to write about somebody you love or you don't love, because we match you with the subject. Uh, we commission you to do it, and, and we will not go and commission somebody who is not interested in a subject to do it. Okay, so that, that, that is one thing that um, uh, has to be very, very, very uh, clear. So, uh, the, 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 in my case, my position is that um, if somebody asks me to write some, 
represented by somebody I don't like and I don't think I would do justice to the person, I would say no. And I think there is a need for the writer to be passionate about the subject. And I'm not saying negatively or positively passionate, but passionate about the subject. And once the writer is passionate about the subject, they will be able to do it justice. It will be an easier project to execute. Because if you are writing about a, a subject whose contribution you respect, whose contribution you cherish, the process is going to be easier for you to write than when you're writing about somebody you are struggling with your conscience as to whether you should write about them or not write about them. But at the end of the day, as I said at the beginning, is what you say about the subject that interests me, not necessarily the subject. One tiny thing, I'm going back. Uh, in 19, uh, I guess, 70 or so, in about 77, I wrote about V.S. Naipaul. Yes. I didn't care about Naipaul. It's your first book. <laughs> I wrote about Naipaul because at the time, a fellow called o Irving Howe, that New York intellectual, had written gloriously about Naipaul, but that had, didn't know a thing about Naipaul and the culture. Mike Talbot, who had written The Heart of the Come after the movie, after the movie wrote the novel of The Heart of the Come, we were very angry to meet right into some degree's contestation. And we were saying, here's this guy in New York, New York intellectual, but he knows nothing about Nightball. And he said, we've got to take him on. So I took, okay, I had one part, he had one part, but I took on Nightball, one, because I felt the critics did not know what they were saying. I didn't have to like Nightball. And then I examined Nightball's work. So the question of like or dislike to me, uh, to some degree is irrelevant. It's a contestation, important. You're making a case. And I took on Naipaul, not because I like Naipaul. In fact, George Lyman had called me and said, why don't I write about him? I'm saying I was concerned, you, you think of subject. I was intrigued with what Naipaul was doing. But secondly, I felt that those who were writing about Naipaul had no sense of Caribbean literature. And you could not go and write about a contemporary British artist without knowing people who came before and so. So the like or dislike is, to me, somewhat irrelevant. And you're quite right. Is this subject matter and what you want to talk what about? What you make of it. Yeah. Um, another difference between the three books that occurred to me. Um, Loveless is a writer, first and last. So you were doing a literary biography. And um, many of you will have read um, Funzo's book. It, it, to me, it combined telling the story of Lovelace's life discreetly, because I thought you were pretty discreet, with literary criticism. Um, you go into the novels and you write about them in your capacity as a literary critic, and you try to the extent we can ever do it with a creative writer to tie the major um, events in his life and the environment that he moved through with the various novels and stories and so on. Now, Burnley wasn't a writer, but he did write. Burnley, in fact, wrote a surprising amount. He was a, a great scribbler. He was ever writing. So there are a lot of his, Burnley's writings, which have survived, many, most of them in the colonial archives, either in Britain or here in Trinidad and Tobago. And he was also, perhaps even more so, a man who was written about a great deal because he was an extremely controversial figure in public life in his time. So there's a great deal of newspaper material about him and the colonial office archives in Britain are full of materials about him. So. Um, Selwyn certainly had abundant written material, both by Burnley and by others writing about him, on which to base his book. But I think Judy had a different kind of problem. Um, McBurney didn't write much. I mean, she wrote a few things, but she didn't write much. And of course, um, dance is not a literary art. It's a performing art. And um, somewhere in the book, Judy refers to um, two very brief, precious films of um, McBurney dancing as a very young woman in New York. And she speaks movingly about how important those filmic fragments are. But I think um, Judy had, of course, Judy spoke to people who knew her and there was newspaper coverage of her. 
but she didn't have the literary and documentary riches which both Funso and Selwyn had to write their books. So I wondered if the three of you could speak about these issues of sources and approach. Um, maybe you could start, Judy. Yeah, um, dance is, you know, the most ephemeral exactly. of, of the arts. And of course, when Beryl was working in the early days, it wasn't filmed. I mean, she did make some attempts to write down some of the dances. I mean, I, I, I quote one, one of a passage in which she describes a dance, but you know, how to do it. But it's, you know, like take two steps to the left and then cross your feet over and then turn around kind of thing. So how much use that would be to a dancer trying to recreate that dance, I really have no idea. I mean, I should maybe have gone and asked a dancer to try it out. Um, so very little of the work she actually choreographed remains. It may be that a few of, of the dancers who worked with her might be able to recreate little snatches of it. And even in the, the, the two soundies that you mentioned, they, they weren't films of Beryl dancing. It was um, Sam Manning, a Calypsonian, who was big in New York at the time because Calypso was popular in New York at the time. And she was sort of dancing to accompany him. So she wasn't the major figure in that either. Every now and again, you know, he, he will, he's singing a Calypso and then every now and again he will step back and she will step forward and do a little dance with, with two accompanying dancers. So yeah, there's that. As, as Bridget said, Beryl did not write a lot. I mean, she was one of the artists um, who spoke, for instance, there was a symposium on various arts that I think the School of Continuing Studies did. And even then, Beryl didn't write it down. So somebody had to more or less transcribe what she said. And it wasn't you know, written in complete sentences and, par and paragraphs. I don't think Beryl had made any notes. She spoke off the cuff. So whoever was transcribing it had to kind of turn it into sentences and paragraphs and so on. So we're not sure how accurate it was as a record of what Beryl was actually trying to convey. And then um, her folk house, the house where she lived and that she wanted to turn into a sort of museum of, of the arts. Um, as we all know, that was demolished a few years ago. Luckily, shortly before that happened, um, the board of the Little Carib got wind of that and sent, where well, they, they borrowed an army truck and some of them went in and carried out everything that was left there in boxes, a lot of it, because the house had been vandalized, a lot of it had suffered water damage because people had stolen the, the plumbing fittings, so water had been gushing all over these books and papers for ages, a lot of it was damaged by insects, mold, etc., etc. Um, they brought it, to the, brought it here to the Heritage Library. Um, so I came here and asked about the Beryl McBurney collection and they said, oh yes, it's just been catalogued. Um, and yes, you can see it. And then they came back and said, well, actually it hasn't been catalogued, but it has been fumigated. And they very kindly allowed me to go through 35 cardboard boxes full of piles of books because Beryl was trying to set up a library in the folk house. It was a, a pretty random collection of books. Some of, the, some of them were books she probably had since she was a child. Some of them were books that she had bought for the occasion. I mean, there was a history of the Catholic Church in French in something like 19 volumes, for instance, which wasn't terribly revealing about Beryl. <laughs> there were a few letters and personal notes to friends, things she had written to... Um, Sir Hugh Wooding, who was chairman of the board of the Little Carib, to describe her own very precarious financial situation. There was a letter from Sir Hugh saying, Dear Beryl, if you are still interested in being on the board of the Little Carib, you please, please come to a meeting now and again, and so on and so on. And I had to go through 35 boxes of, of you know, um, water damaged books, worm eaten books. Goodness knows what else was in. I mean, I had the librarians very kindly provided me with a mask and gloves every day when I came to go through the boxes. Um, so I didn't find as much material as I had hoped. So yeah, gathering that kind of, of information about her work, there isn't a lot of it. Her main legacy at this point really is the physical 
theatre and, to, to, and also the, the companies that arose out of the Little Carib Dance Company, which you know, didn't survive even during her own lifetime, the companies that were formed by other dancers who were trained by her, or the theatre companies that started at the Carib, like the theater, Trinidad Theatre Workshop, even though she and Walcott eventually fell out and she locked them out of the Little Carib and right. they, were, they were homeless for 20 years afterwards. Um, quickly, Punto, what should a literary biography be? <laughs> it should be the, the study of the ideas of the writer and the study of the sources of ma the material that gave life to the various characters in, in the writer's work. Well, one thing that I, one quick thing, I know time is upon us. When I was wrapping up this project, something struck me that I have known Lovelace for forever. And um, a lot of people may think that um, he's aloofish, that he doesn't, that is a kind, that doesn't show his emotion uh, publicly. But when you look at something in his work, you realize how much he appreciates friends. And I discovered that by looking at the dedications in his books, I could actually trace a number of character traits. The people he dedicates each book to are significant, significant people in his life. And people who he needed to apologize to, like his aunt, for the way he treated, treated her. When he ab abandoned her for his mom, his first book was dedicated to her. And then when he d discovered that um, he couldn't write enough books to recognize all the important people in his life, he, he came up with this fantastic idea, Insult, where there is this match at the end. If you look at that good right. match at the end, right. all his friends' names right. are listed, right. in the, all, all of, uh, listed there, which was his way of saying, ain't true, thank you. Books, uh, the Margaret, thank you, and so on and so forth. And I, 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 and I thought that was very, very useful. Because I want to, well, uh, probably should go into that. I just said two things. Uh, mine was an intellectual biography. It was. Uh, it the was. whole archive of work, Burnley was a writer, point one. The second point, we take the position that somehow these slave masters are dumb. That's not true. Uh, Burnley was a very important guy. His brother in law was David Ricardo, who was central to Marx's theory of, who wrote in Marx the theory of value, which of course Marx used. He met with someone like uh, on democracy. Uh, this guy who was speaking, um, de Tocqueville, yeah. he met with him in France, he talked with him in France. Yeah. He was very much a part of the age, he was very much, the last point I'd make, the way to see him is I sort of compare him sometimes with Thomas Jefferson. Mm -hmm. You were a slave, Thomas Jefferson was a slave, but he virtually, a slave owner, but he virtually write the, uh, the, uh, the, Amer the American Constitution. And of course, take into consideration the fact that he's very much into like Locke on the whole question of empiricism, which they use. So he was by no means a dumb guy. He was more an intellectual biography. And so therefore, there's a lot of work which one had to examine in that sense. Brilliant. OK, I think it's time. We have 10 minutes, I believe. Time to open up to the author. Um, OK, I'm Debbie Jacob. Um, we don't have much time. So if there are lots of people, keep it brief. Please. Okay, I have three short observations leading to the question, which came out of the comment that you made at the beginning, saying you were surprised how many people are here. Um, I, I work in a school that represents 45 different countries, and the, their favorite literature is nonfiction. I did a study in Port of Spain prison about the most uh, favorite literature inside of there, 96% was nonfiction, 80% was biographies. And I get calls from these so-called at-risk schools and rough schools all the time that said they can't get the children to read, but they like biographies and nonfiction. So I would like to know why we are not realizing this and recognizing this in this country, and why it's not reflected more on, in school curriculum. Wait, hold. Okay, I'll take two more questions and then we'll get the panelists to respond. Um, over here. Ruben Deary? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it doesn't matter. We don't have a lot of time. I'm getting ominous signals from the back. Good morning. Good morning. Now, I understand uh, from what you said that, okay, you want to know what the 
biography, the ideas or the opinions or the sense of the person from a biography. But my question is, have any of you ever discovered something unknown that totally changed your thinking or made you pause in your writing about a particular individual? I, I, that's a great question. I was going to ask them um, what surprised them most about their people. Okay, I, I think we can take two more questions. So I recognize this lady and Ruba Deary at the back. Um, I wanted to say something because for me, I've always had an interest in biographies. But it's like, I don't know, is it, is it a special thing? Because for me to access learning about the art of writing a biography, is the, I, I don't have access to that. So, I mean, it is a kind of a chicken and egg situation. To, that's my comment for me, coming from somebody who wants to start to do it and who doesn't know how, where, when to look for stuff. I mean, I've been hunting the net and all that. And that's the problem. I think they are great people because I love to do profiles and I love to do profiles in article form. But biographies, you don't really, there's for other forms of writing, there's loads of stuff about how to write poetry and this and that. But when it comes to biographies, it's a different thing. Hi, uh, first of all, congr congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, doing the archaeology into our landscape and into our species is so, so very important. Um, we, one, um, the government has on record, on, as, a, as a cabinet note, to do 44, 48 um, biographies and histories, which was one at cabinet level. They're supposed to get $200,000 to the uh, writers, historians, and biographers to do a particular set of work. These are historians who've been working on particular fields for a particular point in time. And they were going to, um, so this is approves that money to get to them so they could complete the research and publish. Um, it has been on the books for the last like four years and they haven't released them when they released only one. I say that they must, we who are interested in such things can put pressure to have that money released. Louis Regis died whilst waiting on that money to, to complete one of the things that he was doing and a couple of those other historians are also advanced in age. The, the subjects themselves are advanced in age. Um, so, you know, those who are interested, that we should put some pressure to have that my release because those texts are first generation texts that are exceptionally important to um, the historiography of, of, of the country. And, uh, and the other thing is that uh, the Artist Coalition, the project that we're working on right now is the creation of a National Hall of Fame, which kind of brings together all the, the work that has been, been done by archivists, historians, groups like Banya and all kinds of different groups together in one place. We have massive archives already in our collection. The question now is the real estate and the money to these areas. And we have a public thing right now, but it's the lit, those of you who are here who are interested in such matters, that this is, I think, the most important nerve ending institution that the country needs that can shift the country to another space, uh, National Hall of Fame slash National Portrait Gallery. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks a lot. All right, thank you, Rubidiri. I can see we're gonna have to talk talk to you about these um, classified plans. <laughs> right, we just have time for the... Hmm? So we, have we have 10 more minutes? Is, is that correct? Yeah. Oh, okay, well, okay. Um, yeah. and, then, and then I really have to let the panelists yeah, say I their piece. You just use the mic because they're recording. Right, uh, yeah, so I agree with uh, Dr. Funcho in terms of, uh, you know, and I think the sentiment expressed by uh, Professor Kajou uh, with regard to the idea that we must go back and uh, find all the characters in our history and, and, and exhume them. And the fact that slave masters, yes, there are no biographies. You know, I've been doing some work lately and it's, you know, you, uh, you, you encounter them, they're everywhere around us, but people don't know about them because the history has not been written. So that is a laudable act. Now, the question comes to how we write about these particular characters. And it seems to me, Dr. Kajo, that you have taken a position uh, that, uh, uh, and, uh, that Burnley is like Thomas Jefferson. And of course, the prevailing discourse around Thomas Jefferson is that despite the fact that he was a horrendous uh, rapist, 
uh, uh, of children and a slave owner, he is still a hero and he should be memorialized and celebrated both in academia and in public spaces. So the question to you is, uh, is that how you, because uh, I haven't had the opportunity to read the, 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 the Slave Master, I haven't read it yet, but I'm, going to, I'm looking forward to it. But the question is, is that how you want to have Burnley remembered? Like a, as, a, as a person who is a flawed hero who should be memorialized both in academia and in public spaces. Thank you. Right. So um, Selwyn could speak to that, that question if he wishes to. And then I want the other two panelists to respond to some of the interesting comments and questions. Selwyn? You know, we get tied up with a lot of... Thomas Jefferson was one of the major intellectuals of his time. He happened to Sally Hemings. He had children with Sally Hemings. I taught the very first book by uh, which he did. So that's, that's not the question of what I want. My, uh, Burnley was the subject of my biography. Get that correct. He's the subject. The second point is not whether it's laudable or not laudable. I spent 10 years not because it was laudable or not laudable. I come from it from the standpoint, how do we know? It's an ontological question. How do we know what we know? How do we understand our society? And I'm saying, if you have a society that has slaves and masters, you go to, I said it yesterday, three of the major books of the 19th century, Black Reconstruction by Du Bois, CLR James's are Black Jacobins. They begin with the, the planter class. You can't understand slavery without understanding the planter class. So this kind of subjective nonsense where he should be remembered as at this. I don't care how you remember him. My obligation is work. And my obligation is to say, if we're going to understand who we are, we have to examine every dimension. And I chose to write about him, one, because of importance. And secondly, because there's a personal connection. On, on, on a related topic, um, I would like to bring up the um, biography of Naipaul by Patrick French, which absolutely scandalized everybody when it came out because it was an authorized biography, but Patrick had access to every, yeah, ev ev everything about Naipaul. He, was, he went and, and he wrote about how Naipaul treated his first wife, how he be behaved when she was dying how he treated his Argentine mistress and so on and so on, and various other unpleasant things about Naipaul. And Naipaul let him, Naipaul didn't change his mind and say, no, you can't publish this about me after all. Because his, Naipaul's position, uh, which seems to have been borne out, is that that doesn't really matter. It's the work that counts. Um, and yes, people still do think, well, it, it has been verified that yes, he was an awful person, but <laughs> nevertheless, he wrote some great books. So, you know, there isn't this simple dichotomy, you're either a hero or a villain. Um, I'd also like to say that I agree absolutely with Debbie about um, the lack of respect for not just biography, but nonfiction in general. People do like to read it but there is a lot more emphasis locally on the creativity and general wonderfulness of fiction and poetry because anybody can write nonfiction. But I mean, that, there's an art to writing nonfiction, constructing a, a biography, as Selwyn said, just as it is to writing a novel about somebody. It's different. I mean, you have to make sure that everything in it actually happened but it's still an art, and it, yes, it should be, it should be better respected. Um, to the person who was asking, you know, how do you go about writing biography? I think um, having been a journalist is, and, and written a lot of short profiles of people is very useful in that respect, and using that kind of technique. I mean, one of the, one, the book I'm reading at the moment, because I interviewed him the other day, he was here just now, but I think he had to leave, um, Gary Young, is um, another day in the death of America, which t it, it, he picked a random day and he wrote about 10 young Americans who died by the gun on that day. So they were random in that sense. And he tracked them down using very basic reporting techniques by, you know, Googling them, finding out how to get in touch with their families, going to where they lived, where they died, describing what happened to them on that day, how they met their end, what their lives had been like up to then. 
So that's what you have to do. Start with the absolute basics and build a picture of the person from those beginnings. Um, just something Debbie said about how we are surprised about the number of people here. It was not a comment about the topic. It was a comment about the last day of the festival, Sunday morning. The, uh, yes, so that's why, that's why we're thanking people for, for coming out. And last night, all the writers were partying and fetting and, and so on. So we're kind of happy that so many people uh, came out. Uh, there was a question as to if we found something that surprised us. Uh, in my case, because of the length of time I had known my subject, I mean, for over 20 something, 30 years, uh, I didn't, nothing surprised me. Uh, things were confirmed for me, nothing surprised me. <laughs> Um, not so much about Beryl, but in the case of Richard Bridgens, um, we know him, if we know him at all, as this man who drew pictures of enslaved people and the man who, did, who designed the first version of the Red House. Um, and I also discovered that in small circles in Britain, he was and is very well known and highly thought of because he had an earlier career in Britain as a furniture designer. I mean, there's furniture that he designed or copies of it in the Victoria and Albert Museum. And somehow he ended up in Trinidad um, owning a plantation with his wife. They couldn't make a living from that by then because this was shortly before emancipation, which is how come he ended up being superintendent of public works and designing or trying to design roads and bridges and the Red House. So that was a surprise and being able to put together those two sections of his career and, and trace how come he ended up here, having been apparently successful in Britain, doing something completely different. Well, you know, I uh, what, one minute, sorry. I what, what surprised? I started with nothing, <laughs> so everything surprised me. But what was, in, what was interesting, how his book became a kite, the last of it had those herons in Orange Grove. And the amount of international publications that were reviewing the book it was almost a review of the book all over. So everything was surprising because I started with nothing. Right. Well, I think this has been a very, very rich discussion. I urge you to um, look for the books. I'm sure they're on sale. I'm sure the authors will be delighted to um, sign. And yes, nonfiction biography is a very important literary art. So let's big up the biographers and the non-fiction writers. <laughs> and um, thank you all for coming. And I expect Nicholas, will, there's another event starting immediately. So decide where you're going. Thanks so much, everybody.